good morning good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are watching us on the behalf of nepal institute institute for international cooperation and engagement i welcome you all to the international young scholars summit 2020 i extend a very warm to their distinguished chair for the session professor bk deepak fellow scholar and participants who have joined through Zoom. And to the people who are watching us live on Facebook, we are glad to witness your presence today. This international forum aims to bring together rigorous and rectorized rec young scholars from all over the world over a single platform. The aim is to create an academic space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relation, political science, diplomacy, public political, public policy, administration, and related subfields. The conference will held for the three days consecutively and will have 30 sessions, with two sessions running parallelly throughout in white and green rooms. The conference will feature 275 scholars from 25 different countries who will be delivering their presentation and sharing their understanding on various topics with us. The session is streaming live on our Facebook, so feel free to share it on your social media handle with the hashtag IYSS2020. This is a 12th session of the conference to chair and moderate the session it's a real pleasure to have with us Professor B.R. Deepak. Dr. B.R. Deepak is a chairperson center for Chinese of Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. B.R. Deepak was trained in Chinese history and India-China relation at Peking University, Chinese Academy of Social Science, Beijing at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and University of Deckingburg, UK. He has been the Nehru and Asian Fel Asia Fellow at Chinese Academy of Social Science, Beijing. He is an author of numerous book, books. Among the several of his publications, his recent one includes China's Global Rebalancing and New, and New Silk Road 2018. 2017, India and China Foreign Policy Approaches and Responses 2016, India and China 1904 and 2004, A Century of Peace and Conflict 2005, some of his translation from, Hin from Chinese to Hindi and English include Z Xiling, A Critical Biography 2019, A Four Books 2018, Four Values of Chinese Civilization, 2018, 18, The Enclit of Confucius, 2016, Penicius, 2017, My Life of Courtness, 2000, 2010, Chinese Poetry, 1100 BC to 1480, 2011, A Translation of 88 Selected Classical Poem, from for which he was awarded the 2011 the special book prize of china without any further ado i request dr br deepak to take the session forward thank you over to you sir thank you Vasundra. thank you for the nice words uh, it's uh, wonderful uh, to be here on sunday morning uh, in india and very good morning to all of you and uh, all the participants wherever you are uh, it is an excellent initiative by NIIC uh, to have the congregation of uh, young scholars, uh, international young scholars, and uh, uh, let them uh, share this uh, stage and share their findings and whatever they are writing uh, and researching on uh, China. Uh, we have uh, an impressive uh, line of uh, young scholars, eight of them are there. And as I've been strictly advised by the chair that uh, we should not exceed time limit of eight minutes. So I request all of you 
to be within the time limit uh, allocated to you. And of course, I will be the timekeeper primarily. And if I have some um, comments, maybe I'll reserve them uh, for the uh, end of the session. Uh, because uh, we have to wrap up this session within uh, 100 minutes time, that is maximum. Uh, so as uh, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, time for discussion before that. So I uh, request uh, all of you to abide by these rules. You know. uh, without uh, you know, uh, going any further, so I'll request uh, my first speaker of the day is Dr. Pafrilo uh, Capesa. I'm sorry, I may have pronounced uh, her name uh, incorrect. Uh, I apologize for that. Dr. Capesa is assistant professor, Northeast Christian University, India. And she would be speaking on reading India's troubled Northeast through the lens of India-China geopolitical rivalry. Kabeza, over to you. And your time starts now. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Professor Deepak, for the time. Uh, because of the very limited time that we have, I will not go into the conceptual aspect or the background. I'll go straight to the paper. Um, Northeast India, as we know, is sandwiched between Nepal, Bhutan, China, Myanmar, and Bangladesh, and making its uh, territory more than 98% of its territory is international borderland. It is geographically isolated from the rest of India and connected to a tiny corridor known as the Siliguri Corridor or, or popularly known in the region as the Chicken Snake. But this geographically isolated uh, region of India is India's gateway to Southeast Asia and hence its strategic location. And uh, Northeast India as a region has uh, always has always had its geo geostrategic uh, importance and is a highly militarized zone even before the Indian independence. For instance, during the Second World War, the region was a front line between the Allied forces and the Japanese forces. And um, interestingly, the Indian troops that took part in the war remained in the region. So basically, Northeast India has been highly militarized for all. More troops were deployed and stationed in the region after the 1962 India-China War. And uh, added to that, in 1971, during the India-Pakistan 1971 War or the Bangladeshi War of Independence, the region was actively used and uh, used for hosting guerrilla camps by India for supporting Bengali revolutionaries. And uh, it, after a post nineteen uh, post independence, the rise of independence, the rise of nationalist movement in the region also witnessed the large deployment of troops in the region. And uh, there is so much deployment of forces in the region for two reasons. One being to suppress the nationalist movement and the other to police the international borders. This is interesting because many of the nationalist movement in the region has links or connection or are implicitly supported by the uh, neighboring countries. The most, the most recent uh, security concern in the region has been the uh, issue of water security and environmental issues because Every the region witness every every developmental project or you know every developmental project is accompanied by a large troop deployment in the region, and this is ostensibly done, of course, to uh, neutralize the Chinese build up in the region. So these are some. This is the background or a brief profile of Northeast India for those who doesn't know Northeast India. Okay, so. Um, this brings us to the question, are this, uh, this deployment and stationing of troops in the region motivated by geopolitical reasons? This is where my paper comes in. And uh, it, it's a fact, it's a matter of fact that despite the impressive size of the Indian army and you know the uh, large military and armed weapons, the biggest weakness for the Indian army has been the troop movement. And this uh, 
and the 1962 war, the ghost of the 1962 war continues to haunt both policymakers, publics, and uh, academics, even if it is not uh, adequately acknowledged. So this this makes us this makes us wonder if the stationing of troops, deployment of troops in the region has something to do with you know the geopolitical uh, has something to do with geopolitical reasons rather than uh, purely the law and order issues that is portrayed to be. Most of Northeast India, including Assam, Manipur. Uh, Nagaland and some part of Arunachal Pradesh falls into what is categorized as the disturbed area. These disturbed areas are created for regions that uh, have law and order problems. And this gives the justification or the explanation for stationing massive military personnel in the region, unlike or not seen in any part of the country except for Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, can the idea of the disturbed area and the deployment of troops thereof be considered a part of the strategic game plan, a part of the military preparedness in case of any eventuality? That is the question I wish to pose. And in the light of the border incursions, recent border incursions, we have seen that a recent border incursions, we have seen uh, that India once again struck or uh, used the disturbed area in the region. A reports of Chinese intrusions were already uh, there even before they make it to the public or to the media and which were done late. But around, what is interesting is that around the same time, the governor of Nagaland, who is also, uh, yeah, the governor of Nagaland ramped up many concerns and many accusations against the state government in Nagaland, for instance whereby he is uh, explicitly threatened the imposition of, you know, a governor of uh, president's rule and because as a result of the massive corruption and law and order problem in the region. So uh, this is one instance which shows that uh, the government of India or the Indian state might be implicitly, implicitly using the disturbed area, the concept and the idea of disturbed area to sort of station or uh, deploy troops in the region for any eventuality. And this is uh, true because China and India's relation has not exactly been peaceful. Of course, the idea of a full-fledged war does not, uh, it's not, it's not applicable anymore these days, but low intensity conflict will continue, border skirmishes will continue. And this, uh, the stationing of troops can be seen as a um, demonstration of it. as a, the stationing of troops, the military preparedness in the region can be seen as a demonstration of resolve and strength on the part of the Indian government. A, for a country, a, for India, a country that boast uh, that boasts or that popularized the idea of harmony and democratic ethos, something Professor, like you have only one minute. Okay, okay. Uh, something like the Armed Forces Special Power Act that will not will not sell in the Indian public with the Indian public. So that something like the Armed Forces Special Power Act and the massive military presence can only be justified or explained through the lens or through the narrative of national security and keeping the region a disturbed area effectively solve that problem effectively solve that problem. So, uh, all right. And they cannot station troops in the region or, you know, keep the troops in operation in the region without such a narrative. So then uh, my ending observation is that a, the insurgency problem, the conflict in the region, of course, has to do with the nationalist movement of the people in the region. But in, it's also, in a way, it is beneficial for the Indian state to uh, for the Indian state because it ensured India's strategic and military options. And as as such, the Northeast region can considered uh, can be considered as a victim of geography. Thank you, sir. I hope I finish on time. 
Uh, yes, you took half a minute extra, so but uh, well within the time. Thank you very much. Uh, now the next speaker is uh, Gyana Priya. She's a student of uh, Sushant University, India, and she is going to speak on China's relationship with India and Pakistan analyzing the political intricacies in the region. Over to you. Eight minutes again. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, sir. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Shall I begin, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, China is a sleeping lion. And uh, let her sleep, for when she wakes up, she will shake the world, said Napoleon Bonaparte. Greetings to everyone present here. I am Yana Priya, the final year BA LLB student from Shashant University, Gurugao, India. The title of my paper is China's relationship with the India and Pakistan, analyzing the political intricacies of the region. This paper tends to bring out the reasons for the contradictory relationship of China with both its close neighbors, India and Pakistan. After the fall of Soviet Union, the only major global power was China. From then, the growth of the nation is immense and has sustained this growth for quite a long time, especially economically. China has always been challenging the global dominance of the United States of America. Through this process, China has completely disrupted and, to be uh, precise, spoiled its repu whole reputation in the global community. Not only the developed nations, but China also poses a threat to all the develop developing and underdeveloped nations in one way or the other. Despite the he healthy historical and cultural ties with India, India is one such nation that has been facing several impediments just because of China. To top that, China's strong alliance with Pakistan is another factor that poses roughly to India the most. The mutual enmity that Pakistan and China share against India feeds to the intensity of their bond. Due to China's dangerous actions, Pakistan turned out to be the only nation that strongly supports China. Although this support is only because of the huge debt that Pakistan is in to China, uh, Pakistan merely sees China as a supporter of uh, economic gains, nuclear weapons, and missile programs. Uh, as a result, the very uncomfortable situation that China and Pakistan have put India into, especially with the border disputes, it, it disputes is drastic. There are several times that both the nations have tried to uh, get down India together. The 2019 Pulwama attack on the Indian CRPF by Pakistan was a similar cruel attempt and many sources prove that Beijing had a hand in the attack. As, well, as we all know, this uh, June, over 20 Indian soldiers were killed during the border clash with the Chinese forces in the eastern Ladakh. This exact time, the past, uh, Pakistan troops also moved <clears throat> two divisions along the northern Ladakh region. For the first time in decades, India had to face dual front war. It is high time that India strengthen its military and uh, defense forces to the maximum to fight the Asian giants as dangerous as China. India has been constantly discouraging the idea of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, which was launched in the year 2015, but China refuses to abandon the project despite India's very strong opposition. Rather, it would promote the same and gain national strength and thicken its bond with Pakistan, which is again a downhill situation for India. Asserting the Sino-Pakistan alliance since the time Pakistan recognized China in 1951 till now, the state has shared the states have shared 69 years relationship that has stood several tests of changing international landscape, yet remains as firm as a rock, as said by the foreign ministry spokesperson of Beijing. It has been explicitly shared that China will give its utmost priority in neighborhood diplomacy only to Pakistan. The immense political commitment of China towards Pakistan, as always, has been selfish, owing to the regions, uh, owing to the religious and military gains that the country claims. However, the rise of China would also mean the rise of Pakistan. Thus, the Islam is thus the Isla Islamic nation would cross borders to secure their investments. Speaking of the current scenario, it is for sure that the COVID-19 pandemic has been a major driver, putting the states back at the center of geopolitics. Several tensions have arisen, especially due to the fact that Wuhan, China, is, is the epicenter of the novel coronavirus. Multiple theories have come up that Chinese have created or released the virus from Wuhan Institute of, Institute of Virology, 
to trigger a bio war against the rest of the world and rise as global power. It is also said that various whistleblowers of these evidences were hushed down by the government. However, none of these uh, claims met a complete end. Similarly, the border attack by the Chinese troops into India has also suggested that Chinese have stimulated the humanitarian crisis just to distract the whole world while the country can go ahead expanding borders. Presently, China is trying to enter into peace with India, suggesting that the virus is a common enemy to countries and they need to cooperate together to pursue a win-win situation. Even if India agrees to the same, it is clearly evident that the outbreak has also aided China in several ways. With Pakistan, with Pakistan China has signed several deals of hydropower generation projects under CPEC only during this lockdown period. Several intelligence reports have also proven that bio-warfare capabilities are also seen between China and Pakistan. It is also possible that they, in secrecy, are including deadly agents as dangerous as anthrax in their projects. It is very necessary for India to strengthen its defense ties with the United States and in increase security to its peak to prevent China's provocations. The USA and similar-minded countries would definitely come forward, especially because of China's lack of respect towards international laws. Another major step that India has to take is to stop recognizing the one China policy. Just like any other bold move, this one also has its cons but bigger pros. Similarly, if the neighboring countries stop their funding to, grade, to the great development of Chinese military, this might stop them from encroaching territories. Actions as such has to be direct and immediate. On the other hand, Pakistan also has to release itself from the toxic grip to avoid ending up as a vassal state of China, keeping in mind what is happening to the Uyghur Muslims. And with the, every project of CPEC, Pakistan's debt towards China is increasing at an alarming rate. Thus, Pakistan has only two options, either to join a truce with India, USA, and other like-minded countries, or surrender the entire country to China and stay submissive. The future stra strategic trajectory of the triangular relationship would have India compromising to nothing below than Chinese troops completely drawing, uh, completely withdrawing the border disputes. As for Pakistan, any development in the future should not pose as a direct or indirect threat or competition by India, and they would continue to be confident about Beijing's investment in its military capabilities. It is also evident that China will remain committed to the CPEC and will not stop supporting Pakistan in Kashmir issues and its nuclear developments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you finished uh, almost half a minute before. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll reserve my comments, you know, uh, maybe by the end of this uh, session. So may I have the pleasure to invite next speaker. Ashwarya GK, a research scholar, Central University of Tamil Nadu, India. And the topic is Chinese image in India, analysis on uh, media, media, mediatized reflections of Sino-Indian relations. Ashwarya, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so pleased to meet you all, and thank you, sir, for the introduction. Hello everyone, and thank you, sir, for the introduction. And uh, I'm solely belongs to the media and mass communication discipline, so I'm going to present the you know, relation in that perspective, media perspective. So before moving to the article, may I have a word about uh, how important media representation is? So according to Lipman, a scholar, he has said that the mental images that are regarding the world outside is always something the messages and the ideas propagated through media. So, uh, being the most popular neighboring powers in the East, Indochina relations is vital for many reasons. And the matter of wonder is that most of the information between these countries is channeled through their media system. So, each country's uh, media's attitude towards their counterpart is crucial for investigation. And so, there I begin my uh, research and article. No, not yet. I'm not been able to see your. Yeah, now it's, it's, it's there. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. So, my article is Chinese Samaritan in India Analysis on Mediatized Reflections on Sino Indian Relations. 
So actually, it is a comparative analysis of Chinese media versus Indian media uh, in order to understand what is the Chinese image in Indian media as well as what is the image of uh, Indian image in Chinese media. So, so let's first of all look at the two Indian. What is the Indian image in Chinese media? For that purpose, I took a pilot study has done by three uh, Chinese scholars that is Bigyan Ji, Zhen Hu, and Yusuf Muhammad. And in their study, neighboring computer in the image in Chinese media, they analyzed three mainstream uh, Chinese media, that is China News, Global Times, and Kaiser. And uh, in the milieu of Xi Jinping's visit to India in September 2014, and they analyzed this media on one month prior to Xi's visit, and on the month of his visit, and one month after his visit. So at the end of their study, they come up with uh, certain categories of news reporting, that is, these three medias are focused on Sino Indian relations, military forces, oddities, and uh, territory or border issues, and other certain things are the focus of reporting. And they observed that the total attitude of uh, Indian related reports on in, uh, Chinese news media is 30% is neutral and 23% is positive, and 47% is negative. And at the end of their study, they observed that the mediated image of India in Chinese media is negative, is nationalist, and defensive, and also being deemed as a neighboring competitor, and also in the use in the image for China's self-reflection. <laughs> so in order to balance this literature, and I took a research on, um, three, on the same context in three Indian mainstream media, that is, uh, in order to understand what is Chinese image in Indian online media. So for that purpose, I took three media. So this uh, study is uh, limited to these three media only, the Hindu, the Times of India, and Malayalam Manorama. So what we can understand from this uh, study is the China later uh, reports on the Hindu is uh, focused on, uh, again, India's China relations and territory uh, technology, market and trade, and apart from that, the border disputes are the major concerns, especially on Xi Jinping's visit to India. And out of there, we can see that the attitude of the Hindu towards Xi Jinping's visit is 44% is neutral and 40% is positive and 60% is negative. And coming to the other newspaper, the Times of India, they also have more or less similar attitudes and reportage uh, to Xi Jinping's visit. They also cover into China relations, territorial or border disputes, and military. So these are the focus of their reportage. And coming to their attitude, 40% of the news is neutral, 40% is positive, and 16% is negative. So, but the things are a little bit different when it comes to Malayalam Manorama as regional newspaper, but it has worldwide dissemination uh, in terms of readership. So here they have, um, they also focused on the territorial or border dispute. And apart from that, they focused the missile technology and nuclear energy uh, that has created in China. And they also uh, has a special eye on social political issues that has uh, that ha happened in China. So at the end of the study, we can see that the attitude of um, China later reports Malayalam Manorama is 62% is negative and 18% is neutral and 20% is positive. So coming to the end of that research, uh, I came to the conclusion that most of the Indian media are focused on the territorial and border disputes apart from the you know, Indian relationship and the military um, disputes that happen, in, happen between these countries. So the total attitude of these media on Xi Jinping's visit to India is 30% neutral and 31.5% is negative and 37% is positive. So the mediated image on this media uh, in Indian media, there is a third perception and these media are keen to observe China and in its international affairs and what's its effect on India. So they observe China and India as the competitors of the same race and there is, uh, they observe China as an obstruction in the development process, especially in the border case. So coming to the findings of the comparative analysis, these three media evokes a pure and asymmetrical third perception and a trend of competition. And both the countries' media um, affected the military expansion of these countries and the territorial disputes negatively. 
and the chinese media has a special uh, criticism towards indian politics and they have come up with a reporting uh, without any contextual uh, reference to social conflict and especially the indian media has uh, the nature and attitude of media representation regarding china is inconsistent as it doesn't follow any lines or patterns so if there is an event the news reports will be uh, incorrect so my dear friends to bridge the knowledge gap or intellectual deficit in the literature and also to strengthen the bond between these countries what we need, and also to promote mutual understanding for a better future of china and nations what we need is the need for a better mediated and non mediated communication is very crucial and that's it thank you all yeah thank you ashwarya uh, our next speaker is uh, amal anzari student stella maris college india and the topic is a quest for global dominance china's strategic partners amal over to you thank you sir um, i'll be sharing my screen yeah so uh, my paper is uh, titled a quest for global dominance china strategic partners so dr alice l miller who is a professor and a china scholar he said that a superpower is a country that has a capacity to project dominating power and influence anywhere in the world and sometimes in more than one region of the globe at a time and so may possibly attain the status of a global hegemon so in the past two decades china has reaffirmed its tag as a major power economically as well as militarily the people's republic of china is now at the forefront of the international arena after the decline and collapse of the imperial china in the 1800s and the 1900s so a country holding the title of the second largest economy surely would want to position itself at the center of the international system and over global governance institutions so president xi jinping calls for china to lead the reform of the global governance system uh, thus meaning transforming institutions and norms to reflect beijing's values and priorities so the foreign policy strategy of china is uh, in its quest for global dominance mostly pertains to strategic alliances and partnerships this is based on the belief that in the international society the lack of a central government monopolizing military power leads to a security dilemma in which the lesser equipped states align themselves with those having the capabilities and powers to do so in this case china and in recent years it is apparent how beijing has played into this strategy to reach the dominant player status so in the 19th cent in the uh, 19th century british prime minister lord uh, palmerston said nations have no permanent friends or allies they only have permanent interest so when looking into beijing strategic alliances we can acknowledge that sovereignty security and development reflect the common desires of both the partners so in the wake of china and iran having drafted a comprehensive military and trade partnership that would amount to 400 billion dollars worth of chinese investments into iran's key sectors such as energy and infrastructure i think there is an urgent need to look into beijing's strategic partners in its quest for global dominance so um i i am looking into middle east and south asia due to the paucity of the time so looking into middle east uh china is building up alliances and partnerships in the region in 2010 china and the arab league uh, established a strategic cooperation which was promoted to the level of strategic uh, partnership in 2018 and china also has a strategic cooperation alliance with turkey and the other strategic partnerships are qatar jordan iraq oman and kuwait so when it comes to uh, south asia 
Pakistan is a major partner and also a key factor in BRI. So uh, under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, China is developing and managing the port of Gwadar in Pakistan. And Beijing also continues to exert its influence on Nepal and Bangladesh, and again, have developed the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. So China has already constructed a series of ports along the Indian Ocean, creating a necklace of refueling and resupplying stations from the South China Sea to the Suez Canal. So these ports have strategic and military values that allow for China's rapidly growing Navy to expand its reach. Uh, so uh, I think before I end my, uh, I would like to end my presentation with answering this question, is China adapting to the existing world order or challenging the you know, already prescribed uh, order that we are in? So uh, although China has been socialized by the international community, at the same time, I feel like it is trying to change the international system from within. So thus an enlarging and more diversified group of strategic partners has in this sense uh, demonstrated Beijing's growing ability to protect its core interest and shape the world order. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Amal. You finished your speech uh, within half the time allocated to you. Uh, well, maybe you know we have we'll have more time for discussion. So thank you for your presentation. So next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Alpna Verma. So she is uh, a doctoral candidate, University of Delhi, and the topic is blockchain technology in China, cooperation or control. Alpna, over to you. Uh, thank you. Is sir. Alpana there? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank yeah. you for this opportunity. I'd like to express my gratitude to NIIC for this. And uh, under your vigilance, I'd like to present my paper. So let me first try to share the screen if I can. Okay, uh, I'm afraid I will not be able to share my PPT. Uh, blockchain technology, first of all, it's a very new emerging technology. In, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, sorry to interrupt. If you want to share your PPT, please uh, send it to us over here. We'll share it for you. Uh, okay, I don't know how quickly I can do that. Uh, can you mail it to us? Uh, yes, of course I can. Uh, yeah, that'll be great. Uh, so can we have her as the next speaker? Yeah, yeah I think maybe then uh, Alpna, you can uh, wait. And meanwhile, we can uh, start with another speaker. Uh, Anita Thomas, is that? Yes, sir. Okay, so I think uh, maybe we'll uh, ask you to present. Okay, so uh, I have to share so, my PPT, sir. Shall I, sh shall I sc uh, share my screen? Yeah, so you can share. So okay. she's a student. Christ University, India, and her topic is India, a potential wedge to contain China. Yeah, Anita, yes, I can see your screen, so you can go Anita. ahead. One second, sir. All right, uh, shall I begin, sir? Yes. Okay. So hello, everyone. A very warm good morning to one and all. I'm Anita thomas Pedical from Christ Team to be University, Bengaluru, India. And today I'll be topic, uh, speaking on the topic, India, a potential wedge to contain China. So let's go ahead. So I'd like to quote N.R. Narayana Murthy. He's the founder of Infosys. The first responsibility of a leader is to craft a grand vision, articulate it, and raise the aspiration, confidence, hope, and enthusiasm of his people. 
So now let's take a look at how the dragon elephant tango is unfolding today. India today is looking for a quest for equilibrium with China. And so it has targeted the Chinese economy by boycotting investments, goods, services, as well as its cultural influences. Next, there has been a push to the Indian apparatus, namely in economy, technology, health, and security. Next has been a reorientation from a country-based to an issue-based approach. Yes, you heard that right. So we can see the FTA realignments that are taking place, such as RCEP, India is out of it. ASEAN is currently under negotiations with India to take a look at because of the Chinese shadow that has been overshadowing the FTA. And UK and EU are now currently under negotiations with India for, its, for an FTA. Next is building strategic partnerships. Why? For a stable Indo-Pacific order. So there are a line of strategic partnerships that India has signed with dozens of countries. But I have been focusing on certain aspects because of the paucity of time, such as defense, terrorism, technology, and space. Next we see is the, a shift from alliance to partnership building. And we have various trade and defense ties with Russia, Israel, France, USA, Japan, and Australia. So you name it, it's the East and the West. Next, there has been a reinvigorated push to the neighborhood first and the act east policy, namely through economic ties, development partnerships, and disaster diplomacy. So India's focus has been on norms, which is a new orientation for a reform multilateral system. And India has been focusing on ethics and morality by building a sense of trust through transparent development partnership in South Asia, West Asia, Russia. Next has been the successful Vande Bharat operations that India has successfully carried out throughout the pandemic. Next, invitations to Deaton and G7 groupings. I'll spoil alert, India has just celebrated 74 years of independence. And this has also gave, given it a platform for highlighting on UNSC reforms as well as the WHO. Next, building capabilities. India is rightly called as the world's pharmacy. And this, India has backed it up with providing medical aid even to North Korea, and right now it is in the essential stage with vaccine development programs. Next has been nurturing soft power, be it Buddhism, Bollywood, yoga, or the Indian diaspora. It is evident in today's USA's presidential elections of 2020. Next has been disaster diplomacy, wherein India has highlighted on a coalition for disaster resident infrastructure, the SARC COVID-19 emergency fund, which it established in March 2020 proactively. Next has been helping Mauritius in in its oil spill, Bangladesh with Cyclone Amphan. Next has been digital space. The TDSI radio Info interface technology standard has been accepted by the I2 for what? 5G, where? In rural markets. Yes, you heard that right. Next has been celebrity investments from the USA based tech giants in India's digital space. Next has been a search for convergences. And I have been highlighting on three specific areas. First of all, climate change. Yes, India has established International Solar Alliance, and today it is also piloting the uh, role for One World, One Sun, and One Grid. Next, LNT, which is an Indian company, has been instrumental in establishing the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor in France. Then there's space cooperation, of which India has been indigenously a partner, as well as a great aid to Nigeria, Japan, Russia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Oman. Next has been security cooperation in the Indian Ocean region, which is very much evident through logistics agreements with the Quad members, as well as Singapore and South, and South Korea. And, and Russia is going to be a future partner very soon. So as James Carville rightly said, it's the economy, stupid. So yes, Atmanirbhar Bharat is also aiming to be a 5 trillion economy by 2024-2025. And what are the highlights here? national manufacturing policy to be an alternative hub of supply chains and it's evident with the supply chain resilience initiative in partnership with japan and australia next has been a national digital health mission as well as a national education policy next has been pushed to agriculture sectors be it animal husbandry or agriculture infrastructure fund or the promotion for farmer producer organizations india has been striving to develop its economy so in my conclusion, or in my defense, I can quote Reed Hastings, who is the CEO of Netflix. He has rightly said, if you optimize for efficiency, you don't have much flexibility. So if you take a look at the world today, India, as, as we usher ourselves to a multipolar world with bipolar characteristics, India, which is a subcontinent in itself, 
through its strategic autonomy, coupled with a multi-vector foreign policy, can be an instrumental wedge in taming China's ruthless assertiveness displayed in the line of actual control with India, South China Sea, and its wool foreign diplomacy. China's complacent approach towards COVID-19 has ensured a dynamic change in international relations for the next geopolitical great game perceived in the Indo-Pacific. India's strategic ties with the East and the West can manifest the requisite push as a wedge to contain China's belligerence and its arrogance when it comes to its economy. It is also true that India's GDP has drastically dropped, but the spirit of the Indian experiment has been alive and it has been and should not be it should not be forgotten during the 1990s wave of liberalization which pierced India to be the fifth largest and the fastest growing economy in 2019. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Anita. Again, saving almost one and a half minute, uh, minutes for us. Uh, maybe we have uh, you know, more time for discussion. Um, Amal, are you ready with uh, your PPT or not? Sir, uh, Alpna, Alpna. Yeah, sorry, uh, Alpna. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, let me try. Yeah, OK, so yeah. I hope I can now. I was pressing the wrong button. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can, yeah uh, we can see. Please go ahead. Yeah, OK. Uh, so the topic, as I mentioned, is uh, blockchain technology in China, whether it is uh, for cooperation on control. Uh, the, I have divided my presentation into a few uh, slides. The, First, since blockchain technology is not very familiar to us as of yet, since it's an emerging technology, so I'd like to define what it is through a blockchain process flow, the graph that I'll be showing, then what are the applications of blockchain? Like there are so many technologies that is being talked about recently, artificial intelligence, cloud, cloud computing, etc. And then this blockchain technology, how is it a little different from the others that I'll be discussing? and where China stands in the global order when it comes to blockchain technology propagation. What are the major deterrences that, that is blocking China from becoming a world leader in propagating this technology? And then I'll be coming to the topic about whether it is trying to cooperate through this technology or it is trying to control uh, through this technology to begin with. Blockchain technology is basically a kind of technology that helps in storage and transfer of data from in a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Peer-to-peer -peer basis is a server wherein you and I act as servers, are acting as a main component of that chain. So here in blockchain technology, the data is consulted, shared, and secured, uh, minusing the middlemen. Like if we invest in a if we invest in a business firm, say, but then we hold the bank responsible for the monetary transaction. These are the middlemen. The bank is a middleman. In, in blockchain, what happens, the, block, the middlemen are removed from that. It's like a one-to-one face-to-face interaction. Suppose that A wants to send money to B. So what happens is the data that is transferred is in the shape of a block. block. That's why it has got his name here we see that the blockchain is then transmitted to all the counterparts, the, all the mm, computer servers that are present in that transfer. They first go through the data and then they okay that data and finally it reaches to B. Now, how is it different from the prior technologies that the previous technologies, what used to happen is that between the intermediaries between A and B had the power to change that data. Like if I'm investing, say, suppose 10,000 rupees, and then when it reaches finally to the, the recipient, uh, someone in the in between adds something or subtracts something, and then the main, the main crux of the data is changed. It loses its natural, uh, its natural, uh, shape that was being propagated initially. So blockchain technology completely controls that. Applications of blockchain is it, it, it can be used in numerous fields from trade, stocks, security exchanges, banking, finance, insurance, anything you name it, it can be. It's like a master plan. Suppose you want to have, you are sipping a cup of coffee that has been procured from South Africa. You will, a blockchain enables you to know that 
whether the what kind of pesticides were used in the uh, cultivation of the coffee whether the labor payment was justified human rights acts were met or not they were equally paid and even how it was transmitted from africa to anywhere in the world what kind of packaging material was used uh, how much of carbon emission was there like everything that you can think of will be available every data if you drink water from a bottle it has an arrow that shows if you scan it it will show you that how much of carbon was emitted in the production of that bottle it's like uh, though it's a negative term but it tells you from a cradle to grave story of any kind of information that you want so blockchain holds pro holds promise to financial integration and inclusion as well now coming to uh, china's uh, uh, i have been studying this recently uh, that china has been fluctuating between a yes and a no to propagate blockchain but after 20, 2014 it had the people's bank of china has been extensively researching on this technology and it has been propagating in fact in within a four year span of time china has reached the highest number of patents that has been filed across the world in the number of blockchain technology since then the since 20, 2014 the people's bank of china has filed 63 patents related to blockchain uh, blockchain these data have been that i have uh, from china national intellectual property administration it has now what is the problem with china is that it has uh, unlike many other countries in the world since it's an emerging technology it has, doesn't have that population who are very well versed with blockchain so what it has done uh, very many uh, very many popular uh, universe, universities have started a course in blockchain education technology and they are educating their youth but you know, there has been uh, not very welcoming uh, attitude from the youth who have been uh, taking up this blockchain they are more interested in artificial intelligence and cloud computing since it's catching up a little slow uh, these are the how china has moved from 2014 to 2020 uh, in 2019 that was a major breakthrough when president xi jinping himself emphasized on the usage of uh, blockchain technologies and he used the term seize the opportunity though you might have heard about bitcoins that which are which is a kind of cryptocurrency it is banned in china the usage the transaction through bitcoins are banned in china but the possession of bitcoin is not banned so this is a little contradictory in chinese uh, theory that they are using it the cyberspace administration of china uh, forms the rules and regulations that overlook the blockchain technology. Uh, the public and the private, both the sectors are equally embracing this. Like we see Alibaba and Tencent, which uses uh, WeChat, they are using blockchain technology heavily along with government agencies. China in 2020, the month of June, China officially launched a major new blockchain initiative called the Blockchain Based Services Network network this blockchain services network so network will form the backbone structure infrastructure technology for massive interconnectivity through the mainland from city governments to companies and individuals alike now why why people are a little skeptical about this is because it is propagating it is pushing the use of blockchain technology across the digital silk road which is a matter of concern for the uh, participants in that and uh, why is that uh, why is that i'll come to this later if time permits uh, the major four regions that i could initially find out since it's a very elementary research of mine which i'm doing uh, the four major reasons that i could find out why china is propagating blockchain with such such vigor China wants to set the bar of blockchain standards. As we know that US, US has been, the US has been a major contributor to the development of internet across the world and worldwide web. So China through this technology wants to prove its uh, legitimacy in this and, uh, and challenge the US if, if I can say so. The secondly, China wants to be ahead of the US in the trade war. As we have seen recently, there has been a face off between the US and China regarding the trade war and it has lost its uh, 
major exporter, the major trade with the US. So it has been vying for other partners. Now you have to conclude within a minute. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it is vying for support from other other countries like the uh, other nations, other continents like the US. Uh, so it is vying for that. Thirdly, China wants the RMB to have the same kind of respect as the US dollar has. But unfortunately, uh, there is much room for uh, for for the development of our RMB, acceptance of RMB as a global currency, because in uh, a recent data from 2018 shows that the USD, US dollar consisted of, uh, contributed to 61.7% of the global trade. The Euro contributed 20.67%, whereas RMB was a meager 1.8%. So China needs to work upon that. And lastly, it wants to compete with uh, major technologies like Facebook has come up with its uh, uh, blockchain technology, Libra, and then IBM has come up with uh, uh, Venus. So there are many emerging technologies. So it wants to it wants to uh, propagate. It wants to prove its sovereignty. It's uh, it's uh, uh, it wants to prove its sovereignty and lead the world in this blockchain technology, as the US did in case of in case of the internet technology. Finally. Uh, Uh, since the blockchain technology is still in its infancy, it is a little premature to conclude the intentions of China. However, it is for sure that China wants to lead the way to prove its supremacy over its competitors in blockchain technology. Uh, uh, I won't go into the history, just I'll talk about Xi in my last line. She inherits a different era, an economy that's slowing its growth and a society losing faith in the free market. So China realizes that blockchain may be a that blockchain may be part of the generation of industrial revolution. So it needs to look upon blockchain technology as a savior from its uh, fettering economic development. Thank you. So you are muted. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Yeah, so next speaker is uh, Arushi Singh. She's a student, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, India. And the topic is significance of personality cults in governance, the case of China under Xi Jinping and Russia under Vladimir Putin. So Arushi, over yes. to you. Yes, thank you, sir. Sir, is my screen visible? Not yet. Oh, yes, I think, uh, yeah, you are sharing it. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, sir. So, uh, sir, is the, is the PPT visible? Yes. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning to all. My name is Arushi Singh. I'm a master's student at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations at Manipal Academy of Higher Education. I would like to thank NICE for giving me this opportunity to present my paper. The topic of my paper is the significance of personality cults in governance, the case of China under Xi Jinping and Russia under Vladimir Putin. This is the format of my presentation. So why the theme, the salience and significance of uh, cults of personality? First of all, cults of personality are very important as, uh, uh, for power retention purposes through uh, controlling perception and overcoming institutional constraints such as checks and balances. They can, uh, they can help the leader to acquire enormous amounts of power. We have seen this in the case of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin who have, uh, who have remove their term limits and have institutionalized power in themselves. Moreover, uh, personality cults, cults are extremely versatile. We have seen their rise in authoritarian regimes. We have seen their rise in nationalistic uh, uh, states. We have even seen their rise in democracies. So they are a source of concern as they can be mushrooming and leaders of personality cults can also learn from each other. For example, Xi Jinping has been referred to as counterfeit Putin because he has learned from Putin uh, and tried to implement this cult of personality in his own country. Moreover, cults of personality 
are also extremely useful for generation of power, for securing legitimacy, for centralization, maximize, uh, maximization and transfer of power. We have seen this in the case of North Korea and the Kim family who have for three generations, which is basically unheard of, transferred power. And of course, this also hampers the peaceful transition of power in democ uh, democratically elect electric leaders. Moreover, leaders can also use personality cults to institutionalize their past. For example, we have seen this in the case of Xi Jinping, who has come up with uh, institutions such as uh, Central National Security Commission of the S Communist Party of China in 2013. Uh, this uh, commission was recently given biosecurity, and it convened secretly during the coronavirus pandemic to help deal with this uh, with this threat. Moreover, institutionalization is the emergence of orderly, stable, social integrating patterns out of unstable, loosely organized activities. As such, leaders of personality uh, cults try to position themselves at the apex of this institutionalization. And if they are able to, personality leaders of personality cults also prefer to construct these institutions. These are the objectives of my research. I will begin with understanding what is the concept of personality cults. Then I will compare, uh, the, uh, compare the prevailing cults of personality of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. And then I will try to draw linkages between the personality cl uh, cults in Russia and China with the uh, political culture in, these both, uh, in both the respective countries. My analysis and interpretation. The concept of personality cults. So, uh, uh, personality cults have been there since the very beginning. We have seen personality cults, for example, uh, in uh, Alexander the Great and his successors. We have seen this in the case of Augustus and Julius Caesar, and we have also seen this in Perons in uh, Argentina. As such, uh, personality cults have become really efficient and. Uh, through the use of technology. For example, we have seen this in China uh, with the advancements in facial uh, recognition technology. This also makes the citizens complicit in their own subjugation as they are less likely to rebel. And this also creates a really innate sense of fear in the citizens that the survival of the leader depends on the survival of the state. As such, questions have been raised that what will happen to Russia after Putin has left power. The, the sense of annihilation is so innate to the leader himself that leader through the concept and use of personality cults can institutionalize power in himself. One of the examples uh, that have been given by leaders as cautionary tales of of leaders who did not institute personality cults was Paul Pot. So he refused to institute personality cults. And thus, uh, some, of, uh, some of the experts have been of the opinion that this led to his downfall. And when he did, it was just before the Vietnamese invasion. And this also there are also co uh, linkages that personality cults do take a long time to, uh, to bear and to blossom. Uh, to, uh, uh, and uh, personality cults, moreover, uh, there, uh, the leader, he has to have and he develops a sense of grandiosity of his own achievements. He's also egocentric. egocentric. He's preoccupied with illusions of achievements and, uh, one, uh, and unwarranted admiration. Uh, administration and this also this utter disregard for others for example we have seen this in Xi Jinping and uh, like the poisoning of uh, Alexei Navalny and the shooting of Boris uh, Nemstov in just in front of the Kremlin moreover uh, personality cults so personality cult, the term itself, it was popularized by Nikita Khrushchev in a secret speech in 1957, where he condemned the brutality of the Stalinist regimes. Uh, in current practice and in modern, uh, so the modern connotation of the term are have been referred to the practice of an authoritarian leader, typically in non-democratic uh, governments who encourage, even endorse, and idealize artificially created image, a doppelganger image, so as to say, which is uh, which is uh, propagated through the use of mass media throughout the country, even outside the country, to elicit a level of uh, admiration and hero worship. Uh, one of the anecdotes that have been used is the Pravda, the Russian newspaper. So it denounced a book that was written about Russian history because it only used the name of Stalin twice. As such, the argument that was given out by Pravda was uh, Stalin is so central to communism and to uh, the Soviet history that his name should be there in the book multiple times. 
we can see uh, in this photo given below the centrality of Xi Jinping to the institutions and his own institutionalization of his own power and institutions where he is not the leader, his allies have been given key positions and thus he has solidified and cemented his control over all these, uh, over his own country. And of course, he is also expanding his power beyond. The comparisons or comparison of the cult of personalities of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. So I used uh, five, uh, five criteria of Jan Plamper. So first is popular sovereignty. So the leader of a personality cult does not derive his legitimacy from the elites. He derives his leg legitimacy from the people. So to further uh, understand this, I use the concept of pop popularity and polls. Uh, uh, one of the problems that came up was uh, the Chinese polls. I have not been able to find Chinese polls, although I found polls that ranked uh, Vladimir Putin really highly. He's really popular among the Russian public because some of his stance, such as he was uh, anti-90s. So basically, in the, nine, uh, the late 1990s, the, uh, there was a huge fall in not only the prestige of the former Soviet Union, but also in the living standards of the people. The economic reforms were really harsh in the public. We have seen uh, pictures of really long bread lines, and this really traumatized the people. As such, Putin was seen as in sh as a shining light as of stability and uh, and uh, a greater Russia, a great Russia. And Arushi, you have to uh, find it in within a minute. Uh, yes, sir. I really apologize. Another is mass media. So both Putin and um, uh, and Xi Jinping use mass media to uh, to extol their own virtues. We have seen this uh, Xi Jinping, uh, with Xi Jinping, he has his, uh, such as uh, in the newspaper uh, given below. So we can see the space that is given, uh, uh, has been given to Xi Jinping as compared to other leaders in the past. This, this also shows the dynamics of the party itself. So this is a very revealing look into the party itself and the centrality of Xi Jinping to the party. Uh, mass media has also been used by Putin. Uh, we have seen photos of uh, Putin in Siberia putting out fires. We have seen his photos on horseback. Uh, he's trying to exemplify an um, ideal uh, Russian masculine identity and he has used Russian media, uh, media sources such as uh, uh, Russia Today, First Channel, Second Channel to do this. Both, uh, the third criteria is closed societies. So Russia uh, and China have traditionally been closed societies and this has been reinforced by philosophies. For example, uh, the, uh, for example, we have seen uh, that in case of China, only 15% of the population, uh, less than 15% of the population has a passport. So physically also they are closed and there is of course the Great Wall, the Golden uh, Shield and the Great Cannon, which is trying to subdue the population and keep the uh, country closed. And in Russia's case, um, Vladimir Putin has come up with the concept uh, such as RUNET, which is different from its global counterpart. He has also signed a bill where it has been written that no new technology such as smartphones can be sold without pre-installed governmental software in there that can be used uh, to look after the citizens. And both uh, another important factor and criteria has been secular nature of these countries. So we know uh, both of these countries was formerly secular. But in this regard, both Putin and Xi Jinping has diverged where uh, Xi Jinping has tried to reform the institutions, the religious institutions to his own advantage. Uh, Xi, uh, Xi Jinping has totally has totally uh, tried to uh, annihilate these institutions. For example, he has replaced the Ten Commandments in churches with his, own, with his own quotes. There is also a CCP approved Bible with quotes, with, which, where, where there are quotes, uh, his, his own quotes, and also Confucius quotes. Uh, while uh, while uh, Putin has utilized the Russian Orthodox Church to advance his own purposes, such as in Ukraine, this also the cons the fifth criteria is the patriarchal nature of um, the uh, places where cults of personality fl flourish. We have seen in the modern context there have not there has not been a single woman leader in both of these countries. Although Russia in the past have had leaders such as Empress Elizabeth and of course Catherine the Great, and there was of course Empress Wu in China, but in the modern context, there have not been any uh, very high level ranking women. As such, uh, this also reinforces and Arushi, shows- you have taken you know, three, three and a half minutes more, so please conclude, otherwise this is uh, not- uh, Sir, I apologize. Yeah. Yes. 
the uh, the linkages of personality cults in russia and china have been uh, there have been uh, linkages that have been drawn to prolong and to show a kind of continuation with the past and the revolutionary past of the country for example xi jinping has been compared with mao zedong as mao zedong put out his little red book xi jinping has put out a little red app which is uh, compulsory for um, for the state's uh, officials to work on and uh, xi jinping has also drawn comparison with uh, comparisons with the first emperor because of the centralization of power also vladimir putin has drawn comparison with joseph stalin and of course uh, the romanovs so he has uh, for example instituted and brought back the romanov crest farms for joseph stalin uh, as we know uh, vladimir putin has been a great admirer of the soviet past he has refers to, uh, referred to the end of the soviet union as the greatest uh, catastrophe of the 20th century as such we understand there are very clear linkages that can be drawn between the individuals in the past and value written this is also kind of uh, legitimacy uh, uh, cementization where legitimacy is drawn from the past leaders it's itself and of course this is less work for for the leaders where no new sources of legitimacy must be found okay i think you have to conclude it now i this is is okay so we i'm inviting next speaker because you have already taken 5 minutes more you know i cannot allow it otherwise it's not a you know level playing field to all the speakers you know. Yes, sir. Sorry, I apologize, Anders. Thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, you uh, you can uh, you know uh, cl close it here. So I'm inviting next speaker in. Yes, sir. Yeah, our final speaker is uh, uh, Shin Yan, a student at Soka University, Japan, and the topic is uh, China's new HK National Security Law and its impact on global climate action solidarity. Shin Yan, over to you. In. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the previous present presenters. They were very interesting. And uh, I'll just briefly read what I wrote for this presentation. I only have one slide. So it's okay that she went over time because I was prepared that there's gonna be a lot of overtime for this round. Uh, I'll just share my screen. It's really just one slide. And these are my talking points. And I'll just read uh, pretty much what I wrote. So. One second. Okay, I hope everyone can see it. Yes, Great. yes, we can see. Great. So uh, my presentation title is called ooh, is called China's new Hong Kong National Security Law, also known as the NSL, and its impact on global climate action solidarity. And these are some aspects from the the writing. So I'll start with the current 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. Many scientific researchers and political leaders around the world are competing to come up with the vaccine to protect the sufferings of the planet. Many resources, human efforts, and global attention has been paid towards vaccine, vaccination research and economic preservations. However, the arising fear and human insecurities, regardless of countries and cultural groups, poses unprecedented challenges for national leaders to maintain control of their populations. On June 30th of this year, amidst the ongoing protests triggered by the introduction of fugitive offenders at amendment bill in Hong Kong, China passed the Hong Kong National Security Law despite the objections of the local Hong Kong citizens. This law was passed forcibly, demonstrating a fundamental disrespect for Hong Kong's basic law framework. This article seeks to examine the scope of the Hong Kong National Security Law and how its expectations, reasonable or not, will contribute to global impact towards climate action solidarity and peace building progress. The Hong Kong National Security Law comprises of six chapters with 66 articles, which were only disclosed after the legislation came into effect in Hong Kong. The law was drafted by Beijing and then issues such as secessions, subversions, terrorism, and coalition with the foreign countries or external elements to endanger national security. It was also signed and passed immediately upon release to the world. The scope of its impact in Hong Kong includes the arising distrust towards the governmental systems within mainland China and the arising sensations of disrespect for Hong Kongers protesters effort in regard to the formal dispute on the extradition on the extradition bill. Many Hong Kongers feel that the timing of this decision demonstrates the Chinese government's ambition for a, uni for a unified China despite the current sufferings of the pandemic. A key aspect to the forceful, 
forceful identity trans transformation lies in the artic Article 10 of the NSL, with the expectation of the Hong Kong government to, quote, promote national security education in schools and universities, and true social organizations, the media, the internet, and other means to raise the awareness of Hong Kong residents of national security and of the obligation to abide by the law. Policy analysis have noted that the language choice within the new security were, quote, deliberately vague. The open-ended scope for interpretation leaves opportunities for authorities to target selective groups that they find a threat to their existing influence. The scope of HK new security law also theoretically gives the Chinese government global jurisdiction over Hong Kong residents and even non-residents. The most alarming aspect of the NSL is Article 38. The text states that the NSL, in addition to covering anyone in Hong Kong, regardless of nationality or residential status, also applies to offenses committed against Hong Kong, quote, from outside the region by a person who is not a permanent resident of the region, unquote. Legal experts challenges the feasibility of enforcing Article 38 on foreign nationals outside of China as its massive jurisdiction will not be tested until the first case arises, but the NSL's sweeping latitude and threats of detention and surveillance are enough to prompt self-censorship and discourage visitors from traveling to or al allocating for work in Hong Kong. The subsequent actions of Western nations such as the US, the UK, and Canada expresses their deep concern to the underlying of undermining of one country, two systems principle. It can be determined that NSL's imposition lacks a clear scope and sense of compassion for other planetary citizens who are looking to China, a major superpower, to offer help and support. The United Nations having withdraw Hong Kong special status makes the beginning of a foreseeable series of civil and social unrest. Countries such as India and the UK have also subsequently banned 5G deals with Huawei and China-based social media applications out of global insecurities towards China's nationalistic advancements. Meanwhile, our planet continues to suffer on the expenses of global nationalistic competition rather than investing on the potential of humanistic competitions towards peace building. Beyond this year's pandemic and fear-based political advancements, the underlying development for respect of human dignity, compassionate practices, environmental protection, and global solidarity must continue to be national leaders' top priorities of investments. Transforming our circumstances as human beings requires joint willingness for open space, to open space for dialogue on relevant conversations, such as expansion of the knowledge in planetary sciences, eco-literacy, human rights education, peace building, and sustainable development. China's decision to impose NSL during one of the most vulnerable years of humanity fundamentally expresses their fear of losing global significance and international control. National leaders must not be distracted on issues that applies to all living beings, but to stay focused on becoming active solution for the crisis of planetary survival. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you uh, spare two minutes. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think uh, we had uh, a very interesting, uh, you know, panels today with diverse uh, uh, issues uh, uh, being discussed uh, 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 pertaining to India and China, and uh, uh, and also Hong Kong in a, in the final presentation. Uh, very, very pertinent issues, uh, uh, and uh, I'm impressed the way uh, the young scholars uh, in India and elsewhere, they're looking at uh, China and uh, uh, India. Uh, I, I think uh, one thing which comes into my mind is that uh, uh, I uh, feel, because maybe, you know, I come from a very different background, so that is... Uh, you know, I'm uh, uh, rooted in Chinese uh, language, culture, and civilization, and then going into India-China relations. So that may be uh, one of very, very different uh, backgrounds, you know, from other uh, China experts in India and elsewhere. Uh, so therefore, my understanding, you know, uh, uh, is slightly different, and I feel that uh, uh, the kind of... Uh, Synological tools, so which should be there in this country, so they are still uh, absent. 
and uh, we have not uh, you know done enough to build uh, uh, capacity in 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 this area so i hope uh, you know all of you those who are looking at china working in china you have uh, the knowledge of not only the language but also civilization you know i think it's extremely important if you want to see the linkages between the past and present and especially in case of china so they are you know uh, i i would say they are interconnected and they are continuous processes so which is extremely important you know if uh, we uh, it try to just look at uh, what is happening presently which uh, i you know got to see in most of the presentations you know hardly there was any reference whether these things so they were also uh, you know under discussion or debated uh, being debated during those times so right from uh, the first presentation where dr you know capesa uh, talked about northeast uh, you know the insurgency and the sovereignty and the nationalism so on and so forth uh and then you know, cutting across uh, chinese images in india uh, how they are mediated uh, and uh, you know also you know some of the understanding about china's role in south asia and its vicinity uh, i think if uh, we and 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 also including the energy uh, in a part which amal touched upon and then Uh, of course blockchain it is sl slightly you know the latest development it may not have relevance to others but i think it is extremely important to understand uh, chinese behavior uh, you know and how uh, it takes decisions uh, especially at a policy formulation uh, i think uh, uh, for example if you are reading the discourses in china about china's you know outreach in south asian countries so that is uh, uh, this notion being framed in china which is called he xia wen dai so he he is basically to cooperate you know ally xiao is the smaller you ally the smaller country and stabilize the major ones you know which in this context is india so this is a new uh, framework which china has adopted which uh, i thought that i should be pointing out and as far as images uh, is concerned I, i think most of the images were have been built i would say you know uh, during the colonial times so if you want to understand present india china images you know i think you need to uh, go back to uh, that period because they are rooted at that point in time you know right from uh, uh, you can say uh, Uh, late 19th century this march and to uh, his visits to india and then kang yo wei and then so on and so forth you know so i think if uh, you are trying to pick up the threads of that debate you know what kind of images uh, china had about in about india or maybe you know indian uh, images of china or vice versa so i think colonial history it is extremely important uh, to understand um i think uh, another point which amita uh, was trying to put out you know equilibrium with china and she in fact answers herself that it is after all economy you know right and 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 to aspire for that kind of equilibrium without economic heft and uh, maybe the capacity to handle domestic and external challenges it is not possible you know to have that understanding which we are seeking at this point in china so we have to very very uh, clear about that and of course you know to that and so these ftas and strategic partnerships so they are extremely important but here again i think india has been a little uh, maybe inward looking as far as concluding these ftas with the uh, countries in our vicinity that are concerned especially asean you know in the context of rcep uh personality cult you know it was extremely uh, uh, interesting but i'm sorry that i had to interrupt uh, uh, arushi in the middle because she exceeded time but i uh, you know would have uh, uh, been uh, uh, i was i was looking forward rather you know because these personality cult of course 
at this point in time, the channels, they are different. The, you know, it's not the kind of uh, uh, the way Stalin, the way, you know, Mao. So they uh, manipulated masses, in, right? At this point in time, maybe so it is slightly uh, different, but of course they are uh, formulating uh, maybe, you know, these grandized uh, ideas and scheme of things especially Xi Jinping, uh, by propounding Chinese dream, you know, uh, rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, BRI, and various, this health silk road, digital silk road, so and so forth. You know. I think this could be part of uh, uh, justifying, you know, that they are uh, capable of uh, doing uh, uh, what they are doing at this point in time. But, uh, and finally, uh, uh, Xin Yan's, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, a topic on Hong Kong uh, has been widely debated. I myself has written a couple of articles on that. But one, uh, you know, uh, thing which I'm you know, intrigued about, even if there were provisions, you know, about this NSA in the HKSR, uh, Hong Kong Special, you know, uh, Administrative Region, it was that. But somehow it has not been enacted. You know why it has not been enacted? In, in fact, Article 23 of HKSR it clearly says that you know so this would be enacted. But right from 1907 to all up to now, so maybe China is losing or lost patience because maybe you know uh, Hong Kong uh, they uh, do not want to uh, enact it and. Uh, of course, there may be, you know, various reasons for so that, that, that remains, you know, one of the, maybe you can pick that up in the discussions. So when we open it, this discussion. So I think with these uh, few uh, uh, observations, uh, I throw uh, the session open for discussion. We still have, I think, uh, uh, maybe around uh, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, so, a forum is open for discussion. I, I don't know what is the procedure. Are you raising hands, uh, uh, you know, uh, through the app or? Uh, because there is a provision of raising hand and I don't see any hand being raised at this point in time. So, uh, sir, sorry to interrupt you, but for the questions, we usually ask uh, the audience to uh, insert, insert them in the text form in the chat box. Okay, so then you will read it out or I will read it out? So, so it's up to you. If you want me to read it out, I'll read it out for you. But if you would like to go forward uh, with the reading process, you can do it. But I, do I see any question at this point in time? So uh, no, sir. Just give me a second. I'll get all the questions. There will be, uh, there will be questions uploaded in the uh, YouTube uh, live. So just okay, give so, me a second. Yeah, so maybe you can collect the questions and then we can you know, deal with them one by one. Sure, sir. Sure. Just give me a second. And meanwhile, uh, you know, Xin Yang, if you would like to react to what I, I, I said right now. Yeah, thank you for mentioning. So the purpose of my article was focused on the context of what we're all going through at this time. And so the immediacy of how it's being pushed, it's not unreasonable to assume that there will be ongoing conflict and tension between the local protesters and the government. Uh, a lot of Hong Kongers who I have you know, interviewed before talking about this particular article, they expressed their fear towards the Chinese government so there is this confusion going on about what does it mean to have one nationalistic identity? What does it mean to call us brothers and sisters when you are holding guns towards us? So there, it's a self-contradicting activity to, to say that you, we are one when in fact we are not. So that's why this article was focusing about using nonviolence communication and compassionate practices to handle the situation um, about an admin, an enactment of uh, NSL and the article that you mentioned. Uh, usually when it comes to policies, there is drafting and debate that goes on. But with the case of NSL, it was signed and passed on the exact same day. So it's not a draft, but even though they called it a draft, 
And this is where there is a confusion because Hong Kong scholars are very understanding that they themselves are educated. So why didn't you come and seek us who hold a disagreement with your opinion and, and want to push back on your academic understanding? Clearly, they do not want to have that conversation. So I mean, it was not the job of the you know, uh, Chinese parliament to deliberate on it. It was the job of uh, Hong Kong uh, you know, legislature to, uh, to, to, to debate it, you know, to formulate it, and then enact it. Uh, that should have been the procedure. That, that's what I'm talking about. You know, there, should be, uh, there should be no need for China to intervene and you know, bring it under the fold of Chinese constitution, so not Hong Kong constitution. Yeah. But you know, my, my understanding of the Hong Kong basic law, I think it was Article 28, it did talk about the inalienable freedom for the Hong Kongese to be able to protest and have freedom of expression. But what is going on in Hong Kong, that's not, that's not protected. So if nobody is abiding by the law, not even the Beijing mainland government, then there needs to be a different way for discussions to be held. And that requires an open format where anyone can speak. But is, is the government willing to take that step to make that announcement? I think that that is something that needs to be, needs to be questioned. OK. Yeah, I think, uh, do we have the questions now? Uh, yes, sir, they're in the chat box. Would you like to read them, or do I read them for you? Uh, OK, let me open it. So I think I can read. Uh, question on um, yes I uh, I can read the question on YouTube the world the world read China through Western media how correct are the Chinese readings to the Western media so I think so this question uh, is uh, to Ashwarya so maybe Ashwarya will you uh, or maybe let me read all the question and then maybe you can uh, answer them one by one, okay, to whom they are directed. So this question is directed to Ashwarya. Uh, so why do the West talk more about China's Tibet and Hong Kong? How about Pakistan's Kashmir, India's Kashmir, or human rights issue in the U.S.? Ashwarya again, you know, the second question is again to Ashwarya. You discuss about China's image in India. So can you please highlight Indian, India's image in China? So both these questions are to Ashwarya. And there is another question, I think this is again directed to Ashwarya. Can Ashwarya highlight India's image in its neighborhood, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka? So I think we have only these three questions. They are all posed to Ashwarya. Ashwarya, you. Uh, yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Did, you, did you hear the questions? Yes, sir. I, I saw on the screen. So coming to the first question, the world reads China through Western media. How correct are the Chinese reading through the West, um, Western media? So let me tell you something. That is, there is a, a, thing that, a thing that we can call net neutrality. So uh, solely coming to uh, the Chinese uh, media, there is the freedom of the press is limited and uh, uh, most of the newspapers and the online medias in China is something under the control of uh, the state. So coming to the Western media, there is uh, comparing to Chinese media, the net neutrality uh, is somewhat uh, somewhat bigger than China. And at the same time, we can see that uh, the freedom of the press is uh, is comparatively um, they have uh, the lavish of the freedom i mean in western media so uh, the net neutrality is something uh, that should be remarkable at this uh, i mean uh, should be um, talked about this point so the western media is always um hello Oh, yeah, yeah, I think you can uh, use at least minimum two minutes to answer all your questions, you know, not beyond that. So maybe uh, we have some more discussion. Uh, that's why uh, we, uh, we, we are getting limited news on uh, China from, uh, from Chinese media regarding China itself. So coming to the second question, 
um, yeah india's image in chinese media so indian image in chinese media is more of nationalist and they always observe Ch india as a distant neighbor and uh, they uh, another thing is they pointed out that india is a neighboring competitor to china so uh, the third perception um, emerging chinese media is far more acute uh, so they observe in, uh, India as a competitor. At the same time, they, they don't feel that threat uh, that Indian media evokes. So that is the answer to second question. So coming to the third question, um, Indian image in other um, uh, neighborhood countries is far more better than uh, China and other Western media. So uh, especially in Sri Lanka and other nations, uh, in, India's technology uh, technological developments and in india's international efforts with other countries is um, is a matter of um, yeah they are keen to observe these uh, india's international relationship especially uh, indo china affairs and so in the speak team they are looking at these issues uh, so they always uh, keen to observe the threat perception evolved by the indian media that's it okay thank you is there any other question Do any panelists? Uh, there is one for Shin, I guess. Shin, go ahead. Yeah, for you. There are two for her, yes, yes. For Shin. Yes. For Shin. I, I think people are probably really curious about me at this point. <laughs> so um, my, my, the, focus of this, the focus of this paper is on climate action solidarity. So in terms of the Japan and China not enjoying a good relations, uh, this will not be within my expertise. Uh, it's historical and it's sociological and it's cultural. I, I, can't, I can't explain this in two minutes, so I apologize for not being able to answer this particular question. Um, I also don't think that you know, international relations should be about whose mistake it is, but how to move forward. So just in terms of climate action itself, I think it's more feasible if we discuss about peace, pro peace building processes and what are some bylaws that can make us better planetary citizens. And these are discovered through science. So talking about science and reliable social sciences, I think it will lead the conversation forward. So the next question, I didn't see the other one. So please on, brief on, me. On the uh, top, I think the second one mentioned is for you. I'm not sure. How will Hong Kong issue impact China's relation with US and Japan? It's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that is one. Month. Why do we? Oh. Um, right, right before that, I the 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 impact of Hong Kong is on for me. It's on the Human Rights Council with the United Nations. So the brutality itself has a global impact. It's not about um, U.S. or Japan specifically. It's more about the stories that's being told and the images that we see and how does that make us feel as human beings. So I don't, I don't think in particular this will affect the relationship between US and Japan, but I do think that this will definitely impact the relationship between US and China. And also, you know, forming very visible allies between uh, the Western perspective of IR and the Eastern perspective of IR and how these two will contract with each other in terms of ideology. So I do see scholars or um, different political scientists taking sides on the issue because they understand culture in various ways. So I, I do see they're having an impact, but the sustainable impact is still what I am focusing on, which is on climate action, because that is the immediate crisis that we're all dealing with right now. OK, is there any other question? Because I don't see it on, uh, on my screen. Uh, so all the questions have already been mentioned in the chat box and there are no further questions. Uh, if all the questions are done, maybe you can have uh, questions from all the panelists for each other. Uh, uh, yes, we have uh, still three minutes, so maybe, you know, I don't know who uh, want to ask questions uh, to your fellow panelists. So you are most welcome. Uh, I wanted uh, I wanted to actually know uh, more about the Asian values debate. 
uh, that's going on. So can like uh, any of the panelists like highlight on that aspect as to how the whole Asian values debate can actually help understand how China's role in East Asia or China's role in Southeast Asia? Any, any panelists would like to take on it? Asian values. Xi'an, what about you? So maybe you can uh, throw some light on it. I'll just contribute. Please jump in after me. <laughs> uh, I, I think one aspect is about not particularly Asian value, but cultural baggage. So the cultural baggage of being from a particular region does kind of determine what is appropriate to live as a sociological being with, within the context of your nation, right? So the nationalistic thinking is usually burdened by political, cultural, social aspects. I think Asian value do change. Looking at China, having so many years of history, a lot of times when I speak with Chinese people, they always say, oh, we have 5,000 years of history. But I say, yeah, but you also have 5,000 years of mistakes. So it is not the fact that having a long durality of having culture that necessarily makes you a better person. It's about how we have learned through history. So when we talk about Asian value or what it means to live as a sociological person is also how flexible we are in terms of recognizing practices that don't work anymore, rituals that are not sustainable. So because my focus is also on sustainable development, I think it, it's important for youth as ourselves to have the critical thinking to see the rituals that we're abiding by is damaging our environment, damaging the people we love and damaging ourselves. So when we are having a critical thinking about what we consider as Asian or Western or not, that is there a scientific, is there a sustainable measure to how we're leading our lives? And if, if it's not, do we, have, do we have the courage to challenge what it is that the ways that we're currently living today? I hope that answers. Okay, that. yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for the intervention. Any, any other panelists would like to contribute because we have one more minute. In fact, we don't have any minute. Uh, I was supposed that we should be wrapping it up within 100 minutes. So we have reached our time. So I don't know, organizers, so can we wrap it up or uh, you, you want to, to give uh, a chance to any of the panelists to intervene? It's absolutely up to you. We can extend it up to uh, five more minutes, but if you want to wrap it up, it's absolutely your wish. Uh, any panelists who would like to stretch it beyond uh, the, the the time? Five minutes uh, more. Sir, okay, so I think uh, Alpna would like to. Yeah, intervene. just what uh, just what to what Shin added. She has perfectly answered that. But I believe that China ha always portrays itself as a victim. I don't know why they are engrossed with that victim mentality uh, thing that they have been marred in the history. But uh, that is not the case, I think. It's a matter of further research, as you said, that we, we need to look, turn back the pages of history. If we want to actually analyze the current scenario with the counterparts that China has, the neighboring countries or the US like. So uh, I think that China has a negative approach, has portrayed itself as a negative uh, in the past, that it has been suppressed, something like that. Uh, but then the economy, the way it is booming and it is suppressing other uh, neighboring nations has a different story to tell. Thanks. Okay, any, anyone else would like to? Yes, Chime? yes. Uh, uh, so I okay, completely agree with what, what uh, Shin said. Yes, yes, I completely agree, agree with what Shin and Asna had uh, contributed. And uh, yes, it, it is true as well uh, that uh, China is playing a victim card in uh, cases where um, they are the ones, they are the harmers, uh, to, to be precise. They are the ones uh, causing or uh, rooting a problem. Uh, let's say getting into trying to get into truce with uh, India or uh, let's say any other uh, neighboring country for that matter. They try to get into, uh, they say, uh, let's get into peace because uh, coronavirus or the pandemic is, is our common enemy and we have to fight against them. But at the same time, they are using the situation, you know, trying to get uh, advantages out of them and um, trying to be, uh, uh, expand their borders, for example. So, uh, 
it's it's uh, it's uh, precise what Shin had said uh, and uh, Alpna had said that they play the victim card while uh, uh, they are completely in uh, mistake themselves. Yeah. That, okay. That's any any that. anyone else would like to intervene? If not, then maybe I'll make the last uh, comment for maybe one minute or so. Uh, I think why China is behaving the way it is, uh, it is primarily because uh, the balance of power, you know, whether in region or in globe as such, it has shifted to this uh, region. And China being one of the you know, largest uh, country with massive economy, you know, economic have to be talked about. And, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, the kind of uh, military expand, expenditure it can afford uh, because of the massive GDP, it is, uh, you know, primarily because of that. But having said that, I think there are also uh, various, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, points for introspection as far as India is concerned. In fact, some people in the box asked uh, India's role in the neighborhood. I think uh, it demands introspection because I may have different uh, take to that. The kind of projects we have taken in Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, whether we had capacity to handle those projects or whether China you know, uh, uh, manipulated uh, uh, the relationship and uh, because of his uh, you know, deep pockets, so it managed that. So we have to introspect that. Uh, and I think uh, India also need to be, I've been uh, saying all throughout that, you know, with smaller neighbors, uh, they are in a very, very precarious situation when they are sandwiched between two giants. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, it, it is understandable, like where they will get the benefit in. And at this point in time, I think, uh, since uh, they see a lot of opportunities in China. So it is obvious so that, you know, they will either try to use China as a countervailing force or try to, you know, uh, you know, you know, take advantage of whatever opportunity it comes from. I think if India is also in that position, uh, similarly, they would also do the same with India. And it, it, it happened if you go back to the history during British India, when China was weak. You know, most of their trade, it was with British India. The most of their, you know, uh, uh, you can say transactions or relationship, it was highly tilted towards the poverty. So, I mean, this, these are the dynamics of international relations. They will continue the way they are. So as far as India's role is concerned in the region, I think there is a case for introspection. There is a case of building our own domestic political, economic drivers, you know, so that these uh, countries, so they repose their faith in India. So they, you know, are comfortable with dealing with India. I think at times I would say that they are not. And of course, China plays an extremely important role at this point in time, you know, try to exploit the uh, wedge between, you know, these uh, uh, countries with India. And this is visible if we see any country will try to do that. So I think best you know, would be to, uh, to, to, to use our, uh, we can say that, you know, uh, uh, levers of uh, national policies in accordance with, and, and, and I think every state does that. You know. So they, 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 they do them to further their own national interest, whether they are smaller countries or bigger countries. So they do it all the ways in. So, but I think still we really need to calibrate our policies and not to, you know, antagonize too much our smaller neighbors, you know, and, 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 and I would say to be magnanimous with them, you know, there is nothing, no harm, you know, uh, to uh, adopt a, a magnanimous approach, resolve our differences. And even if maybe we are not uh, at the power structure, you know, uh, uh, in, in that hierarchy, but still some sort of uh, maybe balance or equilibrium, uh, equilibrium could be maintained in the region. You know. So with these uh, lines, I thank you all. So it was a very interesting uh, session.
thank you all and all the best stay safe thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank you, uh, thank you very much vasantha uh, would you please uh, take over for the word of thanks vasantha yes yes please deliver the word of thanks just a minute yeah distinguished chair speakers ladies and gentlemen we have come to an end of 12th session it's my honor to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of nice to all who have graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to have to make its even a resounding success first of all we would like to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to be a dr b r deepak for agreeing to the session today for our sincere thanks also go to our speakers for being a part of event and delivering such a session we are really honored to have all the speakers with here today friends we would like to acknowledge our gratitude to us friends from diplomatic community expert academias media and different organization finally i must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience who have participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live on you on our youtube channel thank you for your valuable time attention and for making the session productive with your questions we were truly honored to have you all with us in this morning and hope you stay connected with you all in future as well it's being a pleasure also do join us at the next session thank you so much